What is history? The author of this book, Yesh Kar, a historian, a journalist, and an author, sets out to answer this question with the book, What is history? Many learn history in class without even knowing what history is. What is history? In class, you only memorize the historical events recorded by someone in class, right? But do you actually know who recorded those and why? Well, you all probably know that historians are responsible for that job. But here's the real question. What is history? The author of What is History, E.H. Carr, explains this in six sections. The historian and his facts, society and the individual, history, science and morality, causation and history, history as progress, and the widening horizon. The first section about the historian and his facts is mainly focused on the obligations and the duties of historians. The author E.H. Carr talks about how for a historian, accuracy is a duty, not a virtue. He goes on by saying that to praise a historian for his accuracy is like praising an architect for using well-seasoned timber or properly mixed concrete in his building. Carr is emphasizing that one of the most necessary things for a historian is to know the facts correctly. Carr also says that people tend to misunderstand that facts speak for themselves. He corrects that the facts only speak when the historian calls on them, as historians are in charge of ordering those facts, as well as deciding which facts to give the floor. In this section, the author also emphasizes that the historians play a very important role in history. For example, picture Greece in the 5th century BC. The majority of the people will know what Greece felt and looked to the Athenian citizens, instead of what it looked to a Spartan, a Persian, or even slaves and non-Athenian citizens. Carr looks at this example and explains that the history we, students and people look and study are pre-selected and predetermined for us, not just by accident. In this section, the author brings up three points. The first states that the facts of history never come to us pure, since they do not and cannot exist in pure form. They are always refracted through the mind of the recorder. This means that when we take up a work of history, our first concern should not be with the facts, but the historian who recorded that fact. The second point is that the more familiar one of the historian's need of imaginative understanding for the minds of people with whom he's dealing for the thought behind their acts, the author says imaginative understanding, not symphony, let's symphony, should be supposed to imply agreement. This means that historical material should not be taken in right away, but instead should be reinterpreted and well thought out. The third point is that we can view the past and achieve our understanding of the past only through the eyes of the present. For example, to understand it easier, the very words a historian uses, words like democracy, empire, war, revolution, have current connotations from which he cannot divorce them. A historical event through the eyes of a 16th century historian and a historian from the 21st century would be very different. This led the author to a new idea, total skepticism. How can anything be right if there are different views at different times? Carr then asserts that the historian is engaged in a continuous process of molding his facts to interpretation and his interpretation to his facts. It is impossible to assign primacy to one over the other. Therefore, the author concludes in this section that history is a continuous process of interaction between the historian and the facts, an unending dialogue between the present and the past. He then continues that not only is history a dialogue between the past and the present, it's now a dialogue between the individual and the society, which leads to the next section, the society and the individual. In the next section, Carr states that the society and an individual are inseparable. The historians' knowledge is not only for themselves, it is for the society. It states that the knowledge of the historian is not his exclusive individual possession. The men whose actions the historian studies were not isolated individuals acting in a vacuum. They acted in the context and under the impulse of a past society. The historian is still an individual human being. Like other individuals, he is also a social phenomenon, both the product and the conscious or unconscious spokesman of the society to which he belongs. It is in his capacity that he approaches the facts of the historical past. We sometimes speak of the course of history as a moving possession. Carr says that in my first lecture, I said, before you study the history, study the historian. Now, I will add, before you study the historian, study his historical and social environment. The historian, being an individual, is also a product of history and of society. And it is in his twofold light that the student of history must learn to regard him. In the third section, Carr talks about the relationship among history, science, and morality. He criticizes people that call history science. He criticizes by pointing out five things. Firstly, that history only deals with the special things, 
whereas science deals with the general things. Clark speaks out that while it is true that historians do generalize information, just like scientists, he mentions that historians use generalizations to prove their evidences. He then adds that history rather deals on the relationships between general and special things, which neither of them are more important than one another. The second thing is that history doesn't teach lessons. Unlike most people think, Carr says that because history is unpredictable, it cannot be used for things in the future, and Carr says that it is rather for regretting and reflecting on the past, which leads us to our third point, that you cannot predict history, whereas it is possible in science. Carr mentions that predicting is impossible because the element of chance interferes. For example, we don't know if I am going to get COVID-19, but because we know that there are possibilities, I might get the vaccine. The fourth is that history is subjective. Because history is the study of humans studying humans, it is inevitably subjective. And as already explained, because the facts are coming through historians, it might be refracted through the mind of the recorder. And the fifth is that history being intimately involved in questions of religion and morality is thereby distinguished from science in general and perhaps even from the other social sciences. Like this, the author utilizes logos, using logic to prove that history is different from science. In the fourth section, Causation in History, the author mainly explains about the causes. Carr explains that history is the study of causes, thus forcing the historian to constantly ask the question, why? Carr then talks about how questions like this lead to a selected system of choosing what is important. Carr says that, to borrow Talcott Parsons' phrase once more, History is a selected system, not only of cognitive, but casual orientations to reality. Carr also uses ethos in his explanations like this too, by providing evidence to further prove the ideas he has. Next is about history as progress. Carr mostly talks about the difference between progress and evolution in this section. Carr quotes Hegel saying that history progresses whereas nature doesn't. Carr also brings up Darwin's findings about evolution in nature. He points out that people still, however, misunderstand these two concepts. Carr states that these confusions happen because people confuse the sources of evolution in nature, biological genes, with the sources of progress in history, social aquatism. Carr explains that progress in history is the transfer of acquired technology and knowledge to the next generation. He also points out that unlike evolution in nature, progress in history relies on the transmission of acquired assets. Until now, Carr has talked about how history and the historian himself has progressed together. In this last section, Carr talks about three points. First of all, all of the inventions, innovations, and new technologies in the world have a dark side as well as a bright side. Secondly, he talks about how the world has changed so much in history. For example, before 15th century, before the world found out of the new world, the world was centered around Eastern Europe. Now, nearly after half a millennium, the world is not centered around Eastern Europe anymore. And lastly, Carr ends the book by replying to Professor Morrison in Harvard that insists that history should be written in a conservative spirit. Carr says, Professor Morrison pleads for history written in a same conservative spirit. I shall look out on a world in tumult and a world in travail, and shall answer the well-worn words of a great scientist. And yet, it moves.